Uh, hola, muy buenos días a todos. Muy buenos días, bienvenidos. Muy buenos días y bienvenidos a esta uh, conferencia eh, 2022 International Conference on Marketing and Technologies. Eh, es un placer para mí darles la bienvenida a todos los que están aquí físicamente y también a todos los que nos están eh, siguiendo por, por streaming en esta conferencia que pues, uh, vamos a, a celebrar aquí en, en Santiago en estos próximos dos días. Eh, el rector estaba invitado a este acto, agradecemos muchísimo la invitación, pero está, está fuera en una reunión de la CRU en, en Córdoba y para mí es un placer venir a, a esta facultad. Eh, es la segunda vez que vengo esta semana, pero eh, esta es mi casa, así que vengo siempre encantada, muy contenta de esta facultad. A continuación les voy a presentar a las personas que me acompañan en, en la mesa y que seguramente ustedes conocen perfectamente. Eh, eh, a mi izquierda está José Luis Reis, del ISMAI de, de Portugal, eh, de la Universidad de Maía, y que eh, va a ser uno de los que, precisamente a continuación de esta, de esta presentación e inauguración, va a dar una de las conferencias eh, invitadas. Eh, por otra parte, me acompaña eh, el decano de la, de la facultad, Juan Ramón Doldán, y también la profesora Marisa del Río, profesora de esta, de esta facultad y que es en cierta medida la anfitriona o una de las anfitrionas de, de esta sede del, del Congreso. Eh, a continuación eh, tiene la palabra la profesora Marisa Chas. Marisa del Río. Hola, buenos días. Eh, antes de, de hablar sobre el Congreso, muchísimas gracias a todos los que estáis aquí y también a aquellas personas que, que están conectadas online, eh, que son muchas, me consta, a este Congreso. Eh, tengo que agradecer sobre todo a, a la Universidad de Maya que haya dado el paso para proponernos eh, la realización de este evento en Santiago. Han sido ellos los que han tenido la parte activa y nosotros como receptores estamos encantados y se lo agradecemos. A ver, eh, que sepan que cuentan con nosotros para todas las ediciones que realicen eh, en, años, en los años siguientes. Esperamos que sean muchos y muy exitosos. Eh, también, como no, eh, dar gracias a todos los, a los miembros de esta mesa, a nuestra vicerrectora de Estudiantes y Cultura, que como ella bien dice, es miembro de esta casa, vaya donde vaya, y por supuesto a todos los integrantes de esta facultad que están representados aquí en la mesa por el decano, eh, Joan Doldán, que muchos conocéis, eh, que siempre está al quite y siempre se arremanga para llevar a cabo todas las actividades que en esta facultad se le propongan. Eh, tenemos aquí también invitados, aparte del alumnado de la, del grado en Economía y algunos de, del grado en ADE, y esperamos que para todos sean unas conferencias eh, nutritivas desde el punto de vista académico y que, que todos disfrutemos también de la ciudad. Eh, welcome to Santiago and enjoy Santiago. Thank you. A continuación tiene la palabra el decano de la facultad, que me he saltado el protocolo. No pasa nada. Hola, eh, buenos días a todos y, y a todas. Eh, quería darles la, la bienvenida en nombre de la Facultad de Ciencias Económicas y Empresariales de la Universidad de Santiago de Compostela. Para nosotros es una honra que se celebre este congreso eh, durante estos días aquí en, en nuestra facultad. Siempre estamos encantados de recibir a gente de otros países, de otras universidades y celebrar encuentros eh, en los que bueno, se comparten los resultados de la investigación de personas de, de tantos lugares. Eh, espero que estos días aquí pues sean muy fructíferos eh, para todos y, y todas y desde luego, eh, como dijo antes la profesora Marisa del Río, eh, invitarles a que en cualquier otra ocasión que quieran organizar algo de este tipo, pues 
eh, saben que tienen aquí las puertas abiertas y nosotros encantados de, de colaborar con ellos. ¿no? Eh, bueno, simplemente para las personas que son de Portugal, eh, tanto que están presentes como las personas que están eh, en la organización de, de este congreso, quiero dar especialmente a, a Benvida, a todos y a todas, y a, espero que que en estos días eh, se sean muy fructíferos para, para todos y todas vos. Muy obrigado. Perdón, decano. Eh, tenemos también a José Luis Reis, que es el representante de la Universidad de Maya y organizador. Si le queréis dar la palabra. Sí, sí, por supuesto. A continuación, eh, tenga la palabra José Luis Rey, de, eh, Reis, perdón, del Comité Coordinador, eh, como decía antes, de Ismay de Portugal. Ok. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to speak in English. Uh, ok. My Spanish is not perfect, so I will try to explain something in English. So good morning to you all here in uh, this room and, of course, virtually. This is the fourth edition of Isemark Tech, and uh, we are very happy to be here. I have here only some numbers, but before that, I want to first, Vicerrectora, thank you very much to be here with us, Rebecano. And hold on, no, and hold on. Thank you very much, also. And uh, Marisa, thank you very much for receiving us here. It was a pleasure during this four months working with you. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And of course, uh, uh, we also want to thank the coordination committee, advisor committee, and finally Carlos Flaviana and Il Plessman to be here with us. We hope everything that you are going to say to be fantastic, we know that, and it will be a pleasure uh, listening to you. So, we received more or less uh, 200 papers, and from, from that 200 papers, we proved 100, more or less 100, they will be in proceedings. So, we are going to have 20 sessions during the two days of the, 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 the Congress uh, and the conference, and uh, we have finally, in Saturday, the social program, okay, usually we have. So, we organize this uh, in thematical ways, because it's like that that we organize the conference. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, I have here one thing that it's very interesting, it's the first time that we are going to do it, Friday, after Carlos Flavien's workshop about uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. We are going to have here <clears throat> the editors of the journals that are with us. And that will be an important moment to the researchers because it's important to meet personally the editors, the chief editors of the journals. And in that day also, we are going to have the, the best paper. The best paper, uh, it will be the paper that will be a fast track in a journal, of European Journal of Management of uh, Business and Economics. Uh, Enrique Vigne, the editor chef, chief, could not be here because he's doing a master in another university this week, but it will be a, 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 an important moment. So, I hope that all the things went well. Uh, we are going to have to work two days of work, and welcome. Thank you very much again, Marisa, for all the things. Thank you. <coughs> bueno, pues, uh, um, Quisiera simplemente acabar con, con unas palabras. Primero, una reflexión sobre la importancia eh, y que tiene la colaboración entre universidades y, fundamentalmente, enriquecida, además, cuando se trata de universidades de distintos países. En ese sentido, eh, efectivamente, no podemos más que agradecer que hayan contado con Santiago de Compostela como sede para, para este encuentro. Y igual que el rector les daba, la, el decano les daba la bienvenida a la facultad, yo les doy la bienvenida a, a toda la universidad. La Universidad de, de Santiago les acoge con los brazos abiertos a aquellos que están aquí y esperamos a todos los que están por streaming en otras, en otras ocasiones. Eh, todas las iniciativas que favorezcan esta relación entre distintas universidades, entre universidades de distintos países, son muy bienvenidas y, y creo que tenemos que trabajar cada vez más en esta línea de, de colaboración por el enriquecimiento que eso supone. Y finalmente, eh, dándoles efectivamente la bienvenida a la, a la universidad y uniéndome a, a Marisa en darles la bienvenida a la ciudad, 
quería decirles, bueno, he visto las, las jornadas y escuchando atentamente lo que decía eh, el profesor, veo que efectivamente van a ser dos jornadas muy, muy intensas, con, con, pocos, con pocos descansos, pero espero que sí encuentren el tiempo para visitar nuestra, nuestra ciudad acercarse a la plaza del Obradoiro y ver también la sede de nuestra universidad, el rectorado de nuestra universidad, el Palacio de San Jerome y Palacio de Fonseca, donde además tenemos en este momento en marcha dos, bueno, dos exposiciones, una de ellas la voy a inaugurar precisamente a continuación y espero que puedan ser de, de su agrado, está en el corazón de la ciudad y creo que podrán disfrutarlas mucho. Eh, nada más... Eh, les recuerdo que a continuación tienen las dos uh, conferencias, las dos ponencias inaugurales de este congreso, con el propio profesor José Luis Reis y el profesor Carlos Flavián, al que ha hecho referencia antes el, el profesor Reis. Y de nuevo darles la bienvenida a Santiago, que trabajen mucho y aprovechen mucho estos esfuerzos, sobre todo este encuentro, también aquellos que, que, que nos siguen por streaming, ¿no? esta posibilidad de, de cambiar ideas con, con personas que trabajan en, mismo, en el mismo campo, pero sobre todo también que tengan aquellos que están aquí presencialmente la oportunidad de disfrutar de nuestra ciudad y de ser acogidos por ella y por nuestra universidad. Nada más. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, buen trabajo estos dos días. Buenos días. Eh, buenos días. Como mi eh, gallego es limitado y mi portugués todavía más, eh, hablaré en inglés, si les parece. Bien, pues, uh, just would like to say, well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here taking part of this conference, in which I have been participating in several times, but not finally physically. Uh, this is the first edition, so I'm absolutely delighted at the end to be part of here's uh, interesting conference. Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you, thank you very much to Marisa del Rio, um, Professor Reyes. So I'm absolutely delighted to be part of all this. Um, well, I'm going to be focusing my attention now on the presentation. So talking, I would like to talk uh, about beyond the digital marketing and uh, through service automation. Okay, so uh, first of all, we, we have to say that, uh, well, we are living in a world which is changing very fast. Not just because the problems of the pandemic that we have have the inflection that we do not remember from the past or, or many other problems such as the Ukrainian war. So we are in a world which is changing very substantially in terms of, uh, uh, for example, we are watching that, as it has been said by Tom Walwin, is that, uh, well, nowadays the biggest retailer has not uh, any kind of inventory. The most important companies of uh, taxis do not have any taxi. Uh, in addition to this, the most uh, important hotel chain do not have any room, any chain, any, any uh, hotel. So the most important uh, company, comp uh, content provider, as it is the case of Facebook or nowadays Meta, has not uh, any, any uh, is not generating content. Uh, so we are moving from products to the service. We are using everything, but we are not owning anything. So uh, first of all, we can say that uh, those kind of tendencies are being generalized uh, everywhere. Okay, so um, one of the reasons, one of the main arguments are apparently they uh, try to be more, uh, try to be more uh, environmental uh, with uh, to take care of the uh, environmental problems. 
uh, and to try to avoid uh, those kind of things that we use uh, to buy the product, to use and to put it on the bin. Okay, but uh, to tell you the truth, until some extent, is to try to democratize the consumption of things. And, uh, to some extent, this is also reflecting any kind of social deflation. So it is clear that uh, we do not buy books. Uh, we buy more books on uh, Amazon. We do not see. Uh, we do not buy mobiles. We, we do not buy uh, movies. Uh, we use Netflix. Um, uh, many things are changing, and um, quite probably uh, the next step is that we are not going to drive a car, our own car. So many people is starting to think about the fact that 95% of the uh, time the car is in the garage. So we are becoming more commonly buyers of second-hand clothes. Uh, we are uh, trying to be, uh, we are uh, subscribing to many, many different services. Um, in this context, one of the changes that we also can highlight is the uh, change of the introduction of artificial intelligence. So the artificial intelligence that, uh, as everybody knows, makes reference to the fact that we are simulating what the uh, people, what the persons do, but with machines. So those machines are uh, learning, are reasoning, um, they are uh, self-correcting in order to take best decisions in the next occasion. Okay, so uh, sometimes the artificial intelligence also have uh, a physical dimensions which are robots, physical robots, okay? Um, we can say that robots and artificial intelligence is like hardware and software until some extent. So it's the physical uh, dimension of this artificial intelligence will be robots. Um, when artificial intelligence is incarnated by uh, its body in a robot, we can have more clearly that we are interacting with something which is not human. It is not a human being. But also, uh, we are used, uh, frequently interacting with artificial intelligence much, much more commonly than we think to, 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 to be aware, okay? So in fact, every time that we use our mobile phone in order to find new friends on Facebook, in every time that we try to find a new room in uh, Airbnb, every time that we are trying to find a new product to be bought uh, on the uh, Amazon, all those things are being suggested by artificial intelligence. Uh, the current objective of artificial intelligence is to try to understand how people interact and to try to develop a degree of interaction the most natural, the most common possible. Okay, and one of the interesting ideas beyond here is the Turing test. The Turing test is a test in which uh, it has been developed many, many years ago, last uh, cycle, in the middle of the last cycle, and Turing was saying, well, the main changes will occur when uh, a machine can interact with a human and the human cannot perceive that he is not interacting with another human, it is interacting really with a machine, okay? But let me tell you that uh, definitely the Turing test has been surpassed in many situations. So it's very well known the uh, fact of uh, Yuri Kasparov lost playing chess with a machine, and also Google is doing very, very interesting things. Okay, so it's possible that many of you have seen this video, but let me just show you what is the new, one of the, the new challenges of uh, As I said earlier, Google. our vision for our system is to help you get things done. It turns out a bit you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hello, oh, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. 
Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like. What service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. So the important point here is that it is quite difficult to identify which is the persona, which is the artificial intelligence talking. And in fact, they have incorporated some different things that gives the impression that the person is exactly the artificial intelligence. So uh, for example, this expression, uh, mm -hmm, something like that, it's very, very human. So it's something, it has not any meaning, it's just I don't know how to express that, okay? But the question is that the artificial intelligence is really doing things, uh, in some cases, better than the uh, humans. So the, the, the clear example was the fact of uh, Yuri Kasparov, the player, uh, the best player of chess, lose the, the, the game against the, the, the machine, okay? So definitely the robots are generating a lot of doubts. Uh, we have fear to everything that we do not know. Uh, and some people has a very, very uh, is very, very interested in watching what the future is going to give us. And some other people uh, is against everything related with uh, the introduction, the proliferation of artificial intelligence and robots. Um, definitely have, have a lot of concerns in relation to the introduction of artificial intelligence in terms of privacy, in terms of uh, uh, power of of, uh, giving power to a minority of users and so on, and the autonomy that they can have uh, to be replaced by robots. So those are current fears that we have nowadays all across the Europe. Um, well, that's, that's clear. So the, the, the films has reflected the introduction of artificial intelligence always from a very, very negative point of view. So talking about the uniqueness. So those kind of machines, we will be more, more uh, powerful than us. Okay, but the question is that the human progress is based in the use of machines. Okay, and if we would like to progress, we need to use machines. And the question is, who of you will be able to say no to use your mobile phone during one month? Can you raise your hand? How much money do you need to have? If I offer this proposal and you do not use, not your mobile phone, the connection to the internet, how much money? Uh, if I give you uh, how much money? All right, okay, so you would like to change your way of life. Okay, well, but you are just in 100, okay? <laughs> Let me just tell you that, okay? But how much money do I have to give you in order that you don't use the internet for the rest of your life? And you do not know. You do not know how useful it's going to be. Well, the question is that we have built our future in terms of machines, in terms of uh, these kind of things. Um, the uh, movements against uh, artificial intelligence, the movements against progress, the movements against the use of machines in the pro productive process is nothing new. So let's remember that the Luditz in the uh, 18th cycle has the same problem. So imagine that one of those machines were replacing to 300 people, okay? But who of you will be able to have your set doing by hand? Okay, how much money that will cost, okay? Definitely, we cannot be back to those kind of situations. Uh, definitely, there is many things to be addressed. There is many things to be analyzed. So, for example, uh, what are doing really the algorithms, okay? What uh, patterns they follow? So, uh, until what extent they should be autonomous? And if they are not autonomous, who should control those kind of algorithms? Okay, uh, there is a lot of questions that we need to raise. Until what extent they need to be transparent? Uh, the, the discrimination of the of the or the bias of artificial intelligence is an important issue, and the responsibility assigned to the problems that arise when are being used in the artificial intelligence. So, uh, as consumers, we need to know some information: what is being done with our data, with our privacy, uh, until what extent. Uh, 
uh, what, what we should do with the learning generated with artificial intelligence is just to be only a uh, property of the people who is generating this learning or should be shared. So there is a lot of questions that should be addressed. Uh, in any case, so I can tell you that, mm, well, there is, there is questions of privacy. Um, for example, uh, in, in a court, it's not available, those kind of things. Because, well, uh, if you see this video, it's something amazing, okay? Because uh, the question is that, well, let me tell you, I don't know if there is sound. Uh, Well, I think it's more than enough. Okay, thank you. Well, the question is that... Well, the question is, this is a deep fake. It's the people who is talking is the one uh, below, and apparently is being reproduced in the upper part. In any case, we have to say that we only can uh, identify uh, situations in which those kind of things will be very useful. Imagine that after pandemic you are at home and uh, you have an important meeting with your boss, okay? Uh, you just get up, all right. Uh, so you can use this artificial intelligence, which is presenting you in a proper style, okay? Okay? So the applications are really, really interesting in terms of artificial intelligence, okay? Uh, but I just would like to highlight the possibilities that uh, artificial intelligence and service robots be are being offered in uh, providing service. Um, let me tell you that uh, frontline service has been changing very substantially during the last days or during the last years or decades. Uh, when I was a kid, when I was a child, when I go to any store, there was somebody uh, taking care of you asking you what you will need and giving you advice and showing you some specific items that you were interested in buying. Uh, later on arrived the self-service technology and the, in these stores there were nothing. There were nobody uh, giving you a, any kind of service. And now is the time in which we will incorporate, we are going to incorporate different kind of robots let uh, getting us through the store and giving us information where to find the things that we are looking for. Okay, this is happening in retailing, this is happening in uh, hotels, uh, this is becoming to be happening in restaurants as well. Financial service and so on, okay? So this is something, this is any kind of revolution, okay? We can talk about, uh, in this case, of different kind of robots, uh, which are machines which are operating autonomously, okay? Um, they have a physical appearance and we have clear that we are interacting with somebody who is not a human, okay? Uh, they have uh, some interactive skills. Um, they try to replace the humans or to provide uh, a higher service to the people, okay? Um, they have uh, some social presence. Uh, and the introduction of those robots uh, is going to be a challenge and it will be uh, something which is going to change the relationship between the customer and the company. Uh, this is going to be a disruptive change that it is closer and closer, okay? However, we do not need to think that they are just machines. Okay, because when we are interacting with a robot, when we are interacting with some machines, sometimes or frequently we will have uh, sentimental connections with those kind of machines. Imagine, uh, many of you uh, have, have uh, little uh, kids uh, in your home or you have, have or when you were a, a kid, uh, you perhaps know those uh, games of uh, Tamagotchi or Pooh, okay? Uh, so, I don't know if you, are you familiar with Pooh? So, Pooh is a machine where uh, it's just a representation in your mobile phone. Um, uh, you have to feed it, okay? You have to clean it, uh, you have to take care of him, 
Okay? Uh, my kids, for example, were playing with this, investing a lot of hours doing this. Okay? But the question is that if you do not pay attention to this, it's just die. Okay? And I'm telling to my kids what you are investing so much time on uh, these kind of things. But the question is that for them, this is not just a game. This is a responsibility. Okay? And they interact with this machine, but considering that it is not a machine. Okay? Uh, this is, uh, which is happening when we are interacting with uh, virtual assistants, such as uh, Alexa and these kind of things. Okay? Uh, we can uh, associate with human characteristics or not. Um, the question uh, is that uh, this, the introduction of all those machines is generating to the introduction of new characteristics of the service and new possibilities of the interaction between uh, person and, uh, human, uh, and machines. Okay? Uh, as a result of this, we have been developing any kind of a structure in order to analyze the different problems being generated in these new contexts. Um, our proposal is that we need to analyze, in order to improve the interaction possibilities, we need to analyze the uh, virtual assistant characteristics, so how it will be designed, the virtual assistant, uh, uh, what are the main characteristics of the clients, because they will interact or they will condition very substantially uh, the situation and which are the service characteristics. And we have proposed a model uh, talking about these robot design, consumer features, and service encounter characteristics. Uh, in relation to the robot design, I'm just going to go forward very quickly to those things. Okay, in terms of uh, robot designs, one of the things that we need to uh, identify first of all, which are the characteristics. For example, uh, just in terms of gender, I don't know if do you know Piper. Piper is any kind of robot which is becoming quite a standard. In one of the conferences that we are celebrating, I remember to be discussing about five or ten minutes if they were a man or if they were a woman. Okay, but finally, it's a robot. It's not. No, but we 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 can we, we establish this kind of interactive interactivity with uh, these kind of situations. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the ethnicity and culture, the accent, okay? So we have a robot with accent from Galicia, so we have a robot with accent from Andalusia, or they have to have an neutral, neutral language. I suppose that in Portuguese you also have different accents in the different regions, and there should be very marked differences. In Spanish it's very, very, very important, very significant differences. In terms of anthropomorphisms, there is a lot of things to be studied there. In addition to this, well, focusing the attention in the anthropomorphisms, we can say that this is not relevant enough, but we can say that definitely uh, there is a lot of literature talking about the anthropomorphisms in brands. And also, let me tell you that science, we were in the uh, Romans era or the Greeks era, the, we are talking about the gods uh, giving human figures and giving a life like they were uh, uh, alive. And brands are always focusing the attention in uh, ca different characteristics and sometimes giving them some human features, okay? Um, this is all, all, all parts, okay? You can see here the smile or this T, all right? So uh, the aesthetics are very, very important. Uh, but the notification, we need to be notified when we are interacting with a robot or with an artificial intelligence. There's a lot of things to be discussed here. The proactivity, so there's some people who is against uh, being so proactive as Alexa, so it's always offering me bad things, so I really dislike this, okay? Uh, the effect. It's very, very interesting. So we can say, well, but uh, the machines identify all effect. The machines are effective. Well, what I can tell you is that my email, my machine that I have in my email, is telling me sometimes until uh, what is me my uh, approach writing emails, okay? They are saying, well, you are being very formal, you are being very joyful, you are very friendly, and this kind of thing. And it's just reading the words that I am writing, okay? So um, definitely I'm not going to put this video where artificial intelligence starts to identify all emotions, okay? It really depends on the 
characteristics of the consumer. So there are people who are more uh, ready to adopt new technologies. There are people, uh, depending on the age or depending on the sex, uh, there are differences in terms of people, depending on the culture, the personality tries, um, the differences between consumers. Uh, uh, finally, the last thing that we would like to highlight in order to analyze or in order to identify the topics to be addressed in future research, we can talk about the service encounter characteristics. What is the information being provided? What is the involvement level that the consumer will have with the service being provided? Uh, what happens when a failure occurs? Uh, who is the responsible of this? The responsible is the machine. The responsible is the uh, person which is behind the machine. Or what is the responsibility? All those things are particularly important. In addition to this, the product of uh, or service context, okay? Uh, those kind of systems are very, very useful in different situations, in different contexts. Um, it really depends on the kind of service that we are being offered. Is more transactional? Is more relational? Those things are particularly important in those cases. Uh, well, definitely we need to address the possibilities of replacement of jobs and uh, people who is working in the uh, in the companies. Well, there is a lot of things to be analyzed, there is a lot of things to be addressed. Uh, but finally, let me tell you that we need to highlight that uh, social robots are features. Uh, they, uh, we have perceptions of those interactions with those social robots. Um, uh, the consumers uh, are uh, becoming to accept progressively these new of, uh, systems. Um, the companies are starting to use them as a way to uh, increase the service being offered to the customer, but there is a lot of things that need to be uh, analyzed. Um, with this paper, we try to develop a call for action in order to analyze the characteristics of the robot design, the characteristics of the consumer feature, and the service designs. Definitely, we must combine, we must analyze all these things, okay? But also, if those things which are simple things are not enough for you, my suggestion is that you can explore all the kind of things, all the research topics, such as sexual robots. Okay, there is a lot of things to be analyzed there. Soldier robots. And finally, why not? Cyborgs. Well, this person has a problem uh, because he could not identify the colors, but they uh, introduce his antenna in his brain and now it's being contracted because the possibility of distinguishing colors for him is extraordinary, okay? Uh, finally, uh, just allow me to make some uh, advertising of the conference that we organize in the University of Zaragoza. Uh, the conference is online, so we have been or organizing this conference uh, on these kind of things, artificial intelligence, service robots, virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, we are going to celebrate the fifth edition and this conference is always online, so only the first edition <coughs> was offline, uh, but later on pandemics arrived, and now we cannot organize the conference uh, in presence because we have many people participating from uh, states, many people participating from Australia, New Zealand. <coughs> um, it has been becoming an international conference. <coughs> Um, well, we, we also used to have very, very good uh, keynote speakers in the past editions. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in the next edition, we will have also an special issue <clears throat> in the Journal of Service Management. Sorry, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm absolutely sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but humans also, we have uh, some problems. Okay. Thank you, Carlos, for the fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Now, uh, it's time for Ilk Plasman with the... Uh,
the subject, the new science of uh, neuro forecasting. Thank you all. Buenos dias, hola, that's all the Spanish I can say. <laughs> but um, it's on my to-do list of things for my s upcoming sabbatical, actually. Thank you so much for having me. A um, uh, warm thanks to the organizers um, for putting together this great conference. Um, specific uh, thanks also to um, Jose Paulo, that I know since a very long time. We met when I was a last year PhD student, and uh, obviously we haven't changed since then. <laughs> so, and I'm not going to tell you how long that is ago. Um, it's it's my first. Um, um, I'm a conference. Uh, it's great to see also so many female researchers here present, specifically young female researchers, because you would think that this is maybe something quite technical. So um, it's good to see that uh, there's gender diversity here in the room. So I'm, I'm going to talk about something that is a little bit related to what we just heard from Carlos in the sense that he talked a lot about AI. Um, I'm going to talk about the use of neuroscience, which a lot of you might think um, is actually related. When we think about artificial intelligence, we think about neural networks. So these sciences, computer science and neuroscience, actually had a joint starting point. Um, I would say that they're split at the moment because neuroscience is interested in biological plausible models, uh, whereas Basic AI I might not be interested in that. Um, but what you'll see is because we also use um, big data in some ways, um, in my papers I do use also artificial intelligence or very basic machine learning. So it's a big pleasure to be here. And um, I would like to, so what I will do uh, for this talk, you can ask a question at any time you want, because I know for some of this, for some of you, this will be quite new, what I'm going to talk about. It's a bit outside what you usually hear at marketing conferences, um, even if then the intersection with uh, information systems conferences. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm first going to give you a bit of an overview of a NASCAN field called consumer neuroscience. And I'll talk a bit about its applications, and then I will focus on one, which is called neuroforecasting, where, again, I will first give you an overview. And then, um, because I was a skeptic <laughs> until a certain point, um, I did start our own project in this area that um, is work in progress. So it's currently under review. So if you have any comments, um, they're very appreciated. Um, and this is what I will then do for the remainder of this presentation. So. Um, this is actually how this um, started for me. This is my own brain. When I just before I met uh, Jose pa Paolo, um, <laughs> when I was a first year PhD student, and this is how I thought maybe um, you know our preferences for branded product might be looking on the brain. Turns out it's very naive to <laughs> think that we have a region for every brand that we like, right? So, um, but this is um, how this uh, started, roughly, I would say, in in, in 2000, right? So, um, and so, what was interesting here, though, is that at this time, and I'm not sure whether you had the same experience, uh, Jose. Um, so I was a PhD student. I went over to the medical school to the Brain Imaging Center. And to be honest, I didn't really know what this is, but it sounded very cool. So I'm a bit like a technical geek, like most of you guys here in the room. It's like, oh, we can image brains. That's fantastic. Um, so I went over to them and said, look, I'm interested in um, preference formation. Would you be interested in collaboration? And they looked at me and said, young lady, we're medical doctors. We're serious researchers. We're interested in important functions in the brain, such as vision and language. Decision-making is not one of them. Uh, and as you can imagine, you know, I was a bit uh, bummed <laughs> after hearing this. So I went back to the School of Business and Economics. And um, 
A couple of months later, they called me back and said, hey, we thought about this. It's actually not that uninteresting um, because they realized that we make decision uh, almost you know, every minute, depending on how you define decisions, right? So every minute of our life. So, And so from this, then, um, what you see here now is um, uh, a graph that shows you papers with neuromarketing or consumer neuroscience in the title, indexed in the database Scopus. And what you see is that you know there's a steep increase since 2004, and this is only papers that have a marketing angle. There's a broader field called decision neuroscience or neuroeconomics um, that is not captured in in this uh, graph here, right? So and that's so that's what I'm saying is that there's more papers, right? So but so given that we're interested in market-related behavior, um, this is what I picked. And now what is interesting is um, what actually happened <laughs> in 2004 that all of a sudden, you know, there was this increase in interest in this area. And uh, so as, you know, all, most of your researchers here in the room, as you can imagine, there was a very seminal paper published that triggered lots of interest and inspired um, other researchers uh, in, this, in this area. Um, and this was, I always call this a Sam McClure effect. Um, so this is a paper where the first author is Sam McClure. Uh, the senior author is Reed Montagu. And if you actually look closely at the author order, you also find a second person with the name Montagu. And this is the daughter of the senior author, Reed Montagu, who had, uh, um, at high school, the, she went through looking at um, this psychological test that a lot of you will know, the Coke and Pepsi challenge, where you are actually consuming blinded these two drinks and you ask about which one you prefer, and then you ask again knowing the brand information. And what typically happens here is that when people don't know the brand, it's 50-50. The moment they know the brand, um, a lot of us have a preference for Coca-Cola. Right, so and this is kind of the power of branding, and I think this is also what inspired both uh, Jose, pa uh, Jose Paulo and me to uh, look into neuroscience. So, uh, in English, we say genius minds think alike. In German, it doesn't sound that it's the opposite, <laughs> but you know, um, I like the English uh, more. Um, so, and so the first paper was actually around branding, um, and again, this was also my dissertation was about this. Uh, uh, Jose Paulo's important work in this area was also around branding. We luckily found all of the same results. What these guys found, first of all, is that there's a structure in the brain that does encode preferences. So this was both of our starting point, which is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. We were just unlikely to publish this a bit later than, <laughs> than they did, right? So, um, uh, but also, and this is kind of what makes uh, this uh, paper very interesting, is that they found when people are actually experiencing the product, so when they're drinking the product, so they were administering Coke and Pepsi inside the, the scanner, um, then different um, memory-related regions are triggered when you're drinking Coca-Cola as compared to Pepsi. And those of you that are marketing scholars here in the room, it's like, oh, this is very similar to Arcas and Keller's brand knowledge or brand equity model. So this idea that brands are about unique associations, um, and this is in some ways what they found the neural proof of, right? So that strong brands lead to this brand knowledge and associations, whereas uh, weaker brands don't. Right, so, and this uh, paper got everyone excited. It um, uh, sparked a lot of interest, and a lot of researchers um, started this venture to look at uh, marketing-related questions with tools and theories from um, neuroscience and, uh, and related disciplines. So, now, um, and now what is interesting also that, and this is uh, <laughs> very interesting in some ways, because when you look at uh, some of the top marketing journals, most of the papers are actually published outside those journals. They're published in neuroscience, not so much in marketing. There uh, was a special issue in JMR at some point. Um, but um, so there's some hesitation sometimes, I think, in, uh, in marketing academia, not so much in neuroscience or psychology. But what is interesting is that businesses, they love this, right? So you see here, this is a survey from the National Adver um, Association of Advertisers in the United States. They ask um, across the different um, um, uh, uh, 
categories of uh, where companies are in and whether these are small or medium-sized companies or bigger companies. Um, what do we actually think will happen with neuroscience? Is this something that is interesting for companies to use as a market research tool? And um, it turns out here that, uh, you know, a lot of them think it's actually a very good complement. And 30%, and this is, I think it's a very high number, say it's going to replace traditional methods that we're using in market research. So I'm personally um, on board with this. It's a compliment. It really depends on the question that you're asking. For some questions it's that you might be interested, it's very good to just ask your consumers. But for others, this might be harder. And this is where the really the toolkit of um, neuroscience uh, can kick in. Right, so, so, um, I, so I think it will not replace it. It will mostly complement. Right. Um, now, it stopped moving forward. No. Ah, yeah. There we go. So, um, and this is actually a framework that I use when I teach an elective to our um, MBA at INSEAD. Um, how can we actually apply this to business? So there's two things, I think, that how we can leverage neuroscience for businesses. One is um, the idea of understanding consumers better, right? And this is what I've been showing you until now. But it's also, I think, the bigger and the more interesting potential is actually more in taking either the knowledge or the ability to measure and then think about how can we use this for new product development? So how can we use this actually for innovation? And then, so, you know, my, uh, <laughs> most of my MBA students are consultants, so they really like those four-field matrices. So that's why this is also a four-field matrix. So you can think about really looking at specific systems, or you can think about something that is broader, so like the whole brain and so forth, right? So, and this is where you can think about, I can use some of these measures. For example, if I'm interested in attention, where people are looking at, eye-checking is a super cool tool, right? So, and there are even now today AI-based algorithms on how I can, without even using an eye tracker, predict with the accuracy of 80% depending on the algorithm or where people are looking at, right? So this would be an example for a specific, a very specific measure. Um, and then, and this is what I'm going to talk more about in just a second, is the idea that I can also take brain activity from a few participants. I might be even um, not interested in where that is in the brain, although in what I will show you later, um, it turns out there's a consistency in regions, but I could uh, use a black box approach here if I, for example, don't use fMRI, but other techniques, um, where I'm interested in can I actually predict uh, on this basis of a few participants that are unrepresentative for the customer of that company, can I use this to predict how their products will be doing in the whole market of Spain, for example, right? So I take, even maybe I take a few Portuguese brands and I try to predict a market response for a certain brand in, in Spain, right? So this is the, the notion of what is called neural forecasting. Again, what I will go into more depth in just a second. Uh, but thinking about the innovation, right, so where we see a lot of this being used is uh, the idea of variables where we now can have, for example, hard rate variability and all sorts of other things to kind of get into differences in our neurobiology to uh, better understand our behavior um, and maybe also tailor treatments or tailor um, services, well-being services, um, uh, to um, the, the, uh, a segment of the number of one, right? So, and then, so the last one here, so this is a very nice what you talked about, is the idea of um, brain-computer interfaces. So at the end, you talked about that I can actually stick something in, in people's brains um, to uh, help them improve if they have dysfunctionalities. And this is um, a science that has been out there for quite some time. It starts more, most in the medical field. So the idea is if someone um, has an accident and they lose their arm, for example, the brain region that is controlling the movement is still intact. So maybe I can um, develop intelligent um, artificial limbs that can speak to those brain regions. Um, and you see uh, brain stimulation and so forth also used in uh, situations such as Parkinson's, so when people have diseases, um, this is something that's already widely used, and there are lots of uh, you know big uh, agencies such as 
um, DARPA who's investigating in those interfaces. So, um, and this will maybe, you know, merge <laughs> what we will have uh, when we think about smart robotics um, moving forward, right? So, great, cool. So, um, again, I'm now going to focus um, on this part here. Um, and I would like to share with you um, a specific research study that we did to do something that is quite basic for um, marketeers, which is I'm, I'm trying to use this to predict sales of products. Right? So, um, and this is joint work with a lot of people, so this work is always very collaborative. The first author is Martin Varga, a former uh, PhD student at NCAT, now a professor at Bocconi. Um, my colleague uh, that is, comes more from the quantitative background, Paolo Albuquerque, who's also Portuguese, so he shares something with some of you. Anita Tosche, Nadine Gier, and Bernd Weber. Um, and so what we did here is um, uh, imagine a situation, and some of you might remember this, but I, I see some of this, this half of the room seems, oh, specifically the back is a bit younger. Um, you might not remember this. This was the Apple Newton that came out uh, in 93. Can I see who remembers actually the Newton? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're all tech geeks, right? So you, you must remember this. And I have a brother that is also an electrical engineer, so I was sort of <laughs> in that environment, right? So, and so this is something, it's actually a bit like the first version of the iPhone, if you want, but it, com it failed completely, right? So, um, and so then when the iPhone came out in 2007, this is a huge success. It's still one of the market's leaders in its categories, right? So obviously, you know, there's lots of technology development between these two things. Um, but what is interesting is, um, can we actually forecast whether new products will be uh, a flop or not, right? So and you can see that this is an important question. Um, for which we need to actually be able to predict sales, what we're trying to do in our paper. Um, so, because it's a crucial part of business activity, right? So, in order to stay relevant, um, companies need to innovate, right? Um, but we're not good at this, right? <laughs> um, there, you, if you you know search Google, you get lots of different numbers, right? So, I think. The number that I found most consistently is that 40% of new products are actually um, failing, right? So even if companies try to do forecasts about this, because this is obviously very hard to do. Not all of these innovations are obviously iPhones or Newtons. Some of them are also what I like to call marketing innovations, so maybe changing the color of the product, right? So, but you know, what, what I think the important part here is that companies spend a lot of money on this. So there was Danone, the French yogurt company, that spent 10 million euros on a new yogurt brand called the Census, and it was a complete failure. That's why most of you don't know what it actually is. Right? Um, um, and the, some of the problems, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that a lot of you actually work with very closely with companies, is that um, since recently, and most of them still even today, they're actually not very savvy when it comes to a lot of data, right? So a lot of them, I mean, the Googles and Amazons, they obviously have fantastic data science, uh, scientists on board, but um, this is really the, in some ways, the exception. If you think of more traditional companies, they are still lagging behind, right? Um, and um, that's also, I think, one challenge with AI is that we need to make sure um, that this is simple enough for companies to use for this to be scalable in some ways, right? So, um, so yeah, so, so too much data confuses. And then it's also uh, what I always find the most complexing part when I work with companies is that, like, oh, it's not even that they don't know how to do this. They can't take the time to, to look more profoundly at this, right? So with that I mean is that, so they're pressured, oh, this has to get, get out then, this has to get out then, the new campaign has to come out then, um, so they really don't have time to test and learn. Right? Um, and this is changing a bit now with the excitement about behavioral economics, so this idea of we should actually test stuff before we launch it, we should test our policies before we, you know, launch it to, in our countries, um, a lot of, Institutions now have uh, behavioral insights units and so forth, right? So, but yeah. So, generally speaking, um, there's also you know uh, a problem, a resource problem, why companies are not doing it that much, right? So, um, 
And so usually, so if we want to predict sales, what we do, um, we ask surveys, right? So, and I think surveys are very good when we're talking about the marketing innovations, right? So if we want to come up with a product that is slightly different from a very complementary product, consumers, it's easy for them to imagine how this looks like, um, and you can ask them about this, and you can maybe use even then more fancier things such as conjoint analysis and whatnot, right? So, but when you think about the Newton or the iPhone, this would have been very hard to ask people about this because it's new, we don't know. So true innovations, this is maybe much harder to use surveys. Um, other techniques that we're using is we could also uh, look at um, historical data that we have of similar products, right? So this is what my quant colleagues would use. Um, and then, you know, either put them into regression models or um, AI. But again, this has the same problem in some ways as, as a service, in a sense, like this is kind of looking in the past. If there's something completely new, um, this will be worth at predicting this, right? So. And um, now what is interesting is that this idea, or maybe we can use um, neuroscience for this. So there was even, I think, one of the uh, first review papers on this topic that uh, were, was published in the prestigious journal um, Nature Reviews Neuroscience was on the idea, oh, we should use this to think about um, evaluation of innovations. And this was published by Greg Burns and, and then Ariely in 2008, I think. So. So the idea is, so when we look at traditionally how neuroscience work is done, um, traditionally this comes from the medical field, I'm taking different technologies to understand how one person ticks, and this one person very often is the patient, right? So um, then co traditional consumer neuroscience then started, okay, can we actually say something about groups of people? So we have maybe, you know, um, I think both of our first studies had like 18 to 19 people for uh, Jose, uh, Paulo, and me. Now we are at, I think, roughly, we at least 140 people, right? So, um, but it's, it's still a small number of, of people that we're interested in. Um, and so this means that we're interested in predicting their behavior. So here we're predicting the behavior of one person, here we're predicting the behavior of a group of people. Um, and this new idea that was coined uh, really by Brian Knudsen at Stanford University and Alex Janewski, that is today a, um, uh, professor of marketing at the Rostmus University was this idea, oh, can I maybe also take this to predict how the whole country of the United States might be reacting to a product. Right. Um, and so this, the idea here is really, and you can think of this, although I really hate that term, uh, as a neural focus group. So you take <laughs> a few bunches of people's brains and you try to predict outcome on the country level. Um, and so the first paper here um, was actually a bit of an accident. So this was a paper <laughs> from Greg Burns, um, who had a paper, Neuroimage, uh, where he was interested in how um, um, popularity ratings changed in neural signatures underlying um, the liking of songs. And in the study, so in order for this to work, he wanted songs that are not um, uh, were not hits yet, so that were mostly by unsigned artists. And so years later, he's like, oh, remember, so he was talking with his PhD student, remember uh, there we had this paper where we looked at those songs from this unsigned artist, and it turns out that some of those songs became real hits. Uh, and said, oh, can we actually go back to our data and think about whether something in the neural response to the songs would predict how much of a hit they are today or not. And what is interesting, for songs, we have Nielsen sound scan data, so data that is available that you can, can buy or download. Um, and he found, oh yes, there's actually activity within um, a structure that is today part of the evaluation system, the nucleus accumbens, that predicted better than the liking ratings of his participants whether the song became a hit or not. Yeah. And so this paper was published in Journal of Consumer Psychology. Uh, then um, in a slightly, uh, not at a marketing department, but in a school of communications, Emily Falk, she was interested in can we use brain signatures to predict whether people will reply to public service announcements, so ads from governments that are meant uh, to help people to, for example, stop smoking. So she could predict, again, looking at the brain structure in the brain's valuation system, this time the region that um, Jose, Paolo, and I like, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, um, can we use this to predict how often 
uh, people will call um, uh, this hotline when they are exposed to different public service announcements, right? And maybe think about which one is the best of these public service announcements. And the answer was yes, right? So um, then there was a group around um, some researchers in Germany that were interested in um, pop-ups at the point of sale, right? So you see this very often now in the Christmas time, you come into the supermarket and there's a pop-up uh, for the sort of promotional thing um, for, uh, for specifically for, for uh, uh, so Ferrero products, Duplo in this case, um, that uh, will want you to um, you know, buy the product to point of sale ads. And here they also found that the same two brain regions are predictive of sales in response to the ads that, that we're having. Uh, one of my favorite papers in this space was, is a paper where the first author is you know, Venkanta Raman that was published in 2015 in Journal of Marketing Research. Uh, and he really put in an effort, worked with different companies and the um, uh, National um, Agency of Advertisers. Uh, these companies, so this was insurance companies and also companies such as Campbell Soups, as you see here, they gave their, um, uh, what they thought would be their best commercials, and they also gave all of their sales data to him and his team. And what they did is, so they did a horse race approach where they compared different methodologies that you could think of. So for example, functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, EEG, um, other neural metrics such as eye tracking, skin conductance, facial encoding, um, and they compared which one would have the biggest contribution to predicting uh, the advertising elasticities from those different ads. And what they found is that it's actually fMRI and specifically brain activity within these two regions of the brain's valuation system um, that are the best predictor um, for the marketing elasticity. So that's a paper, if you're interested in that, that I can definitely recommend. It's a very, um, very well done, and very comprehensive paper. And then, there's, so that's Alex's work. What he did was also, you see some of this is really dependent on having access to the data. And Alex, so he went to two platforms, um, Kickstarter and Kinova.com, where you have data actually publicly available. You look at, so these are micro lending or micro funding appeals. You look at what got funded or what didn't. Um, and so you have this data available to so the DV that you want to predict is available publicly. Um, and then he had a few people inside the fMRI scanner and looked at um, how the, what happened in their brain while they were looking at those appeals. And again, the brain valuation system was actually predictive of what got funded and what didn't get funded in these two contexts. Um, and then, I mean, there's more, right? So this is just a few examples. This also works well for, for example, predicting social media behavior, predicting people's likes or whether they share stuff um, on, um, or like things um, on, on social media and forward this to other platforms. Uh, as you see here, this was for news and this was also from Emily Fox Group. So, so this uh, sounds amazing. This sounds like, oh, this is almost too good to be true, right? So, and that's why I said, oh, hmm, I want to see it for, my, for myself. I want to do such a study. Um, and that's why I teamed up uh, with a, one of the largest German retailers for food. They have a bit of non-food, but they mostly actually have food. And uh, we were interested in the question, how much will these products sell? So we had uh, different foods and drinks. Um, some of them were their own label. Some of them were, um, you know, um, the, the, the brand name uh, in that uh, category, right? And what we did is, so we looked at, so we liked the um, approach from Renault, where we also tried to do like a horse race. So we looked at data that is available for every retailer. So this is data about promotion intensity, price levels, and whatnot. So it's something for which you actually have this at hand. These are observables in the market. Then we went all the way and did a large scale representative survey of their customers and ask them about attitudes about this product. So, th and this is what they usually would actually do if they have the time. As a retailer, again, you're also a bit in this vicious circle that this has to be fast, and you, sometimes they don't test their products before they go into the market, specifically, you know, if this is a minor change, maybe, right? So, um, and then, um, so these two were conducted in, 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 in a laboratory. Uh, 
um, setting and were also so collected together from the same people. We looked at, rather than asking about hypothetical purchase intention, we asked about incentivized purchase intentions. Uh, yeah, um, so, and they would really get the item at the end. Um, and then while they were doing those incentivized purchases, we scanned actually their brains. Um, and so our research question was, so our DV that we were predicting was like, how much does it sell? So that's kind of what we tried to predict with this exercise. Um, but then uh, we were interested in what's the contribution of all of these different approaches and specifically, you know, does brain imaging data add something to this? Right, so, and uh, before we started, we, you know, <laughs> it was interesting that my marketing porn colleagues were more convinced that the brain imaging data would have a contribution than I was, right? So, and also Anita Tusche, that is the other neuroscientist on that team. Um, so, I'll show you what happened. Um, so, just to give you a bit more of the specifics, um, what we exactly did. So again, so we first had those market variables um, that are uh, that we got from our partners. So the average retail price, promotional intensity, and also the average weekly sales. The survey data. Um, this was a bigger effort where we, using an online platform, asked roughly 1,500 participants. Again, that were representative of. Uh, that company's customers, and that was super important to them, and that's why this was actually more expensive <laughs> for me to collect than the brain imaging data. Um, and so we asked them um, about the attitudes using a standard questionnaire of, the, of these products, so how much do you like this, would you buy this, how attractive do you think the packaging is, um, that we then summed up as a desirability index. And then, so we had 44 participants that were unrepresentative. This was a convenient sample. These were students at the University of Bonn, mostly, but that have been shopped. So they are customers of that retail chain, but you know, this is the biggest retail chain in Germany, so um, it's hard not to be a customer of them. Um, and um, we asked them to do two things, to tell us whether they would really purchase this, so this was incentive and then we did look at their brain imaging data. So now this allows us to specify a structural model where we're interested in uh, can we model sales as a function of all of these data sources. The beauty about this is that then we can, so this is, corresponds to each of these four variables, right? So um, the beauty is that we can drop one to think about um, what <laughs> is the contribution of each of them. We tr first trained the model um, to come up um, with our parameters that we then used to test um, in the subset of the products so out of sample that we didn't use for the training. So this is a real prediction exercise. This goes beyond the um, sorry, um, um, regression analysis. Um, now, so what did we, so if you would have been my participant, right, so you would have been lying in an fMRI scanner, you would have seen there's a product, then um, I'll show you the price, and then you're asked, do you want to buy it or not, right? And I um, would have given you money before you would come, and um, so you could use this money to spend it on these products or not, right? So, um, and so this is a seminal design. It's called the Shop Task from Brian Knudsen. Um, so nothing super inventive that we did here. We were really trying to be very thorough and, and use what other people have done before. And the idea is that here at this point in time, I'm thinking maybe about the product desirability without knowing its price. The moment the price tag kicks in, I'm thinking about its worth, right? So I'm comparing my willingness to pay with the given price, right? So this is where I would do, economists would say, I would do a net value or price differential computation. And so these are the two important moments in time that are predictive of the individual, individual's um, decision to buy yes or no. Right? Um, and so this has been shown in a lot of different studies uh, that, uh, you know, this works. But here we're not interested in predicting this. We're, again, we're interested in predicting sales for those products. Um, so looking at these two different moments and times, we know from previous literature that there's a brain valuation system that is involved at these two points in time. So there is um, the ventral striatum, so this is a subcortical structure uh, that we think of does encode the desirability part. And then there's a region that uh, Jose Paolo and I like, um, um, which is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, so which is here, um, that uh, is involved in this willingness to pay computation in preference formation stage. 
And there's this third brain system that's called the anterior insula. We think of this as a system involved in emotional intensity that has been shown at actually both of these time points also to be predictive of individuals' purchases and also this market level prediction. So these were the three things, the three brain regions we looked at uh, during this purchasing process. Um, again, the um, anterior insula will go in, it's actually, if I make the abbreviation, it's AI, right? So, <laughs> so if I look at the AI, but it's anterior insula, not artificial intelligence, uh, then, so this entered twice for both of these moments in time. That's why it's highlighted in both of these colors. So, um, so again, nothing, so um, we, we're taking a theory-driven approach here. We're not kind of digging through the brain what could be happening here. Um, we're taking what the literature tells us we should do. Now, um, just a quick manipulation check. When we um, look at those brain regions, are they really involved also in our participants to predict their purchase decision? Um, yes, they do. So um, the uh, ventral striatum is really involved in encoding um, product desirability. And the uh, anterior insula and the um, ventral medial frontal cortex are also involved in uh, predicting this, this decision values, so this idea of whether people want to purchase yes or no. Um, so this is good news, so we were happy, but again, so we're not interested in predicting the individual's decision, we're interested in zooming into this brain region, so we're extracting the beta parameters from our regression models um, that we're using um, on these participants and feed this into a different regression model where the goal is to predict the sales of the product. Um, and so what does it mean? So here again, so we have the sales as our dependent variable, and then uh, we have our X here, which are the markets, the observables that we're having. Uh, we have the attitudes based on the survey, the S. We have the Z that is um, the brain activity. And then we have the W, which are the purchasing decisions inside the scanner. Um, these are the products that were part of our testing set. So you see it's a mix of different products, right? So, and this was then our out-of-sample prediction. Um, so we used the model that we could derive from this to predict sales of these products. Um, and again, there's a mix of different things. Now, um, uh, what I can do now, and this is kind of the beauty of this, you know, uh, simplistic model is that I can now think of the, there's a full model and then I can drop one of the variables to think about the contribution of each of these uh, data sources. Um, and this is what I'll show you now in some slightly boring looking <laughs> uh, tables. I apologize for this. I haven't figured out a more appealing way to show them yet. Um, and I hope you can actually read this. So here you see, so, the, so we're doing first Things and we're using, we also have to actually use random forest, so we've used AI for this. I'll ta ta talk a bit about how this looks like in just a second. But so here, um, in, in order to also make this usable for our company partner and other company partners, um, in, in the first version of this paper, we're not using fancy AI. It works similarly, actually, but we're using a very basic um, ordinarily squares regression model because that's something that the companies, data scientists also feel co comfortable actually using. Right. So, and what we see here, so is this, uh, in this first step, um, if you like, the in-sample um, prediction, and what we see here is now I'm, I can add these different data sources. You can see now what actually has um, an important contribution, significant contribution for this prediction exercise. Right? So, and, and what we see here, which is not a surprise, it's actually a good thing, the more data I combine, the better this prediction gets. Right? Um, and so this uh, you know, was reassuring. What we were then really interested in was the out-of-sample prediction. And um, there are different ways how you can look at the quality of an out-of-sample prediction. We were interested here to use as a criterion uh, something that's called the mean absolute percentage error, so the MAPE. Uh, and again, um, we're arguing here that this is something that uh, the managerial literature tells us managers are using also. And um, that's why we felt this would be useful for them, something that they are used to, but it also, if I use other criteria, that's, it's, it's quite similar, so this does not change our results. And so now here you see, um, I'm showing you here now 
each of the single data sources, what is their contribution. And this is amazing, right? So I was so surprised by this, because what we see here that over our baseline model, um, which is the one with the, um, um, uh, where we only have dummies for the, uh, for the uh, category, um, we see that fMRI has an improvement of 28.6%, uh, right? And this is much more than I thought it would actually have, right? So using just fMRI improves my prediction uh, by almost 30%. And you can see that this is relatively high as compared to these other data sources. Yeah? Um, and now what I'm doing is I'm not showing all possible options, just the one that were the most promising. You can see now what happens if I combine two data sources, because often, obviously, we don't have the time nor the money to do all of these things, right? So, um, and you see here um, that specifically the market data and the fMRI data, so data that the marketer has as observables, plus this fMRI data also um, has a 34% uh, um, improvement. Um, over the baseline model, and you know what is again what's not a surprise if I combine all of these, then I'm at 38% um, uh, of improvement over the baseline model. Uh, but you know what I find fascinating is that so this is obviously the best, right? But this number is already quite high, right? So I was uh, positively surprised by this because that means that there is something in this fMRI data that is very useful for this prediction exercise, and it's much more useful than asking customers about their opinion, which I wasn't that surprised about, but you know. Um, and so this is just to show this graphically, how good this prediction is if we take the winning model, right? So it's not a perfect fit, but again, if you, I showed you numbers, how much money we're wasting on not being able to predict at least to some extent, right? So this is obviously, uh, an interesting potential. Um, there's a, we did a couple of robustness checks. I'm just going to run through them. So where we obviously we made some arbitrary choices, how we draw this data, um, and so forth. So we're changing this, and we see that um, at the end of the day, we come to very similar results. An interesting question that those of you that are more business-minded might ask now is like, ah, yeah, you're telling me now that fMRI um, has an important contribution, but it also might have the highest price tag of all of these methodologies. And, you know, that is uh, in some ways true, uh, um, because c costs for fMRI studies can vary. It depends on, um, you know, um, if you team up with a university, for example, this will most likely be cheaper. So what we did is we surveyed different neuromarketing vendors, how much would the study have cost you? Um, and then we um, did the same for the survey. So we didn't take our costs. This was based on a survey on the, on, on the, on the market from where we took averages from different companies that we found. And what we compared with um, is conservative in a sense that um, what I'm showing you here, and, and maybe my intro was a bit misleading. <laughs> uh, I told you we can predict new products. Uh, this has the potential to predict the, uh, the success of the iPhone. Right? So first of all, we didn't have iPhones here. And also, uh, this would be specifically useful if I would look at products that were not marketed yet. Uh, the way, I mean, we were trying with, with the retail, we are trying to do it such that we had products that were only new to the market, but then, you know, it takes almost a year to set up these studies, so this did not work, unfortunately. So um, the moment we did the survey and the brain imaging was not before those products were actually marketed. Um, if you know a company that has a lot of innovations <laughs> and that would be interested in trying this, I'm up for working with them because, I mean, a retailer is already a good bet to have enough innovations for the, uh, you know, for these models to work. Um, but um, the timing for us didn't work. So, so again, that's why we're not looking at um, the value of using this to predict if they would have this data before. The simple back of the envelope computations that we're doing here is uh, for a retailer is obviously important for the management of their stock, right? Um, to have an idea of how much will the product sell, right? So because if they're out of stock, consumers will churn, they will go to a different retailer. Right? Um, and if they have too much in stock, that obviously is costly for them. Right, so and this is the comparison we're doing here. So the knowledge about sales, if I compare this to the costs for being 
either out of stock or having too much in stock, uh, um, what does that help me with? And what we're seeing is, so now we're putting the contribution in improvement, we're putting a, 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 um, um, a euro value on this, right? So, and what you see is, so, um, um, what specifically is of interest here is, is this column here, right? So, and when you look at this, what is interesting is now that the benefits of using fMRI um, is in between these two numbers, and the cost of doing this is lower in some ways, right? So, and depending again on you know on your setup and how <laughs> frequently you might use this, this means now, even if you put the higher price tag of fMRI. Um, on this data source, it's something that is, can be worth doing. Right? Um, so to wrap this up, so what I've been showing you is that if I want to predict sales, the best is to combine all sorts of different sources, surveys with market data, with fMRI. Um, but um, what is very interesting is that the value of only using fMRI is actually quite surprisingly high. Um, and that is true when we're also considering its higher costs actually to use, right? So, and again, I mean, whether this is worth for companies, that's, they, have to, they have to make the math themselves, right? Um, it was interesting then, actually, <laughs> when I went back to uh, uh, present this to the CEO of the German retailer, he's like, oh, this is fantastic, let's do this now all the time. And it's like, nah, you know, I'm a researcher, I don't want to do this now all the time because that, you know, that, you can't get this published all the time, right? So, um, and then, so I was trying to find a manure marketing vendor that would be interested in doing this all the time, and it was hard to find one. Uh, because there, at the moment, the only reason how they use brain imaging is for tweaking ads, right? So and they use a different technology, EEG, and not fMRI. So um, there's potential, right? So if you are working with a market research company that has those biometrics, so this seems to be something that has potential, but that is not picked up by the market yet, right? So yeah, and so to, to summarize this, so it, it's a promising approach really to predict market level outcomes that can get at something that's much more basic um, that even an unrepresentative sample can give us, right? So. Um, and it's a relatively small sample, and this is also why it's cheaper in some ways than the surveys. Um, yeah, um, and so you see, so when I teach this to companies, um, they're excited about this, right? So, but they obviously can't do this on their own, right? So, and that's why, you know, I think moving forward, neuromarketing vendors will adopt this more. They're a bit scared of the fMRI part, and I think they would prefer this to be EEG because, um, fMRI is something you have to run one person at a time. You can't have 20 people in the room. Right? It's not really scalable because it's like this big apparatus that needs this uh, magnetic field around it, right? So, whereas EG, you know, I could put all, on all of you those commercial headsets and I could, you know, see where, predict whether you're gonna cite this paper maybe <laughs> um, later on. Um, um, and that's easy to do, right? So it's much easier to do, it's much more scalable to do. Um, with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and let me know if you have questions. Um, I'm not sure whether we have time for questions or not, right? So, but I'm also here. Um, if you have questions, I'm very happy to answer them. And if you have comments, yeah. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So there, um, there are papers. So some of the papers that I reviewed earlier, they actually used EEG. For EEG, though, um, it's mm, for fMRI. So we have chosen fMRI because there are these two regions or these three regions that are consistently showing up. For EEG, um, these are different metrics that are used in all of those papers. So uh, it seems to work that you can, for example, scan Dutch people's uh, brain activity with EEG to predict US box office sales, which in itself is fascinating. Um, they use this because they haven't seen some of the movies, right? So, uh, and then there's uh, one measure, so they just use um, some amplitude of the EEG response. There's one measure that some people really are very excited about that are interested in social media. Uh, it's a measure of how, when we watch a movie, for example, how much our two brains would be in sync, right? Um, so it's intersubjective um, uh, correlation of brain activity, so synchronicity of brains. Um, and this is a second metric that has also been used to predict um, success of movies. Um, 
So yeah, so I think this might be coming. I've seen even now, um, although I haven't seen the academic paper, one company trying to use um, modeling of visual attention for this, right? So since this only gets part of the whole process, this might be less good at predicting, but I mean, if you can predict some of this, um, uh, this might, because this is a, uh, even cheaper technology and an even more scalable technology, this might be also cool. So I think we're trying to figure out, can we use other technologies for this to get rid of this scalability issue? But well, that's a very good question, yeah. Can we sit here, Carlos, also, because we have five minutes to questions and some yeah. issues about these uh, keynote speakers. So, Carlos, please. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos and Ilk. So we have here some specialists in uh, artificial intelligence, in neuromarketing, and so on. So, uh, Ricardo Caiola, you are a neuroscientist also, so. So, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, thank you, so I'll ask uh, first uh, Ilka, uh, where do you stand in the slide about the 30% for the future? What's your, your opinion uh, that will be? And for Carlos, do you think that the video that you showed will be a reality uh, or is already a reality for, like for my father? The, the video about the, 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 the Lisa asking, it could be a reality also for someone the deep like fake. The, the deep fake video. Yes. All right. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, let me grab this mic. Thank you very much for this question. So, yeah, no, so um, I'm very much on it will stay in the 64%, right? So, because um, it really depends on the question. There will always be questions that you might have. For example, um, if you have a product, um, you know, uh, how should the packaging look like? How should the price look like? How should a certain feature look like? I think it's much superior to think of something such as conjoint analysis rather than putting people in a brain imaging scanner. Um, but for some of this, um, it, it, it can be much more powerful than surveys, right? So specifically when consumers <laughs> don't know or they don't want to say, right? Um, so if this is about unconsciousness um, and things that they don't have stable preferences about, right? So. Okay, in relation to your question, I, I understand that you make reference to the video of the deep fake, isn't it? Yes. Well, in relation to this, I definitely believe that we are going to face extraordinarily developments. Um, also, in relation to this, you were saying you, you were connecting with your father. So, let me tell you that uh, this is a company which is uh, something that heritage, which has become very, very famous because with some, a couple of pictures of a, of a person, they are starting to develop any kind of videos like if they were alive, okay? They were moving the eyes, uh, making a sunrise and so on. Um, well, uh, the, you can see with your own eyes. So the, the, the people who was talking was the people, uh, the person below, and uh, he was being reproduced in, in the upper part. So um, one of the things which is very, very problematic is uh, that we can replace the personality of the people. Um, for example, if you can use this in a code, so it's not allowed to use in codes as a result of this, because you cannot warranty that you are watching is uh, real. So definitely, I believe that very soon. Sorry? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. It were very interesting, both of them. Uh, I would like to ask Professor Hilke. Um, okay, we were, we were talking about fMRI, but you think we will have the same results if we use a combined methodology with all the other technologies like EEG or eye tracking or facial coding as industry is using much more that than fMRI? And, uh, and the second is, uh, what about if we compare all the metrics with fMRI and the other, all te other technologies, mm -hmm. if the results you think will be similar in forecasting as when we use fMRI? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, my data doesn't speak to this because we only used fMRI because um, there was this paper from Minot showing that in this prediction exercise, 
um, fMRI was the most powerful one, and again, because of this idea that we know the most about it, because most of the academic papers are using fMRI. In the notes paper, so he, he did this horse race without having some of the other variables that we are having in some ways, right? So, but he compared within different neurometrics you could think about. Again, he found that fMRI and specifically activity in this system that I showed you um, is the best predictor, so that leads to the best improvement. But you know, you can always argue. Um, uh, you know, that maybe if he would have analyzed the data differently, so he analyzed the data because he, like me, has an fMRI background. As an fMRI person, maybe, you know, if you would have used different approaches, and he obviously didn't specify like 100 models, right? So maybe EG could have been better, right? So there was some, some debate around this in the press, right? So the, some of the EG researchers said, well, we, would, we, we can't look at the whole period. We need to have those little events and whatnot, right? So there could be some technicalities. But I think overall, um, I think what is interesting with all of these papers is that there is a value add of using <laughs> some of those, of those uh, technologies, right? So, um, and for some, so for example, facial coding, that gives me really only the valence without any intensity. It makes total sense to always combine this with, for example, skin conductance that gives me the intensity or something like, um, like eye checking, right? So once I have people hooked up, I can hook them up to several things um, and the costs don't really depend then that much on that anymore, right? So, so I think it's always a good idea to try to combine more methodologies if you can, right? So, yeah. Okay, one more question, please. Okay. So Paul, first Sarah. She comes from Egypt. It's very cold to her. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is for Professor Carlos. I know you spoke about AI from the service automation sector. But uh, from a marketing perspective, do you believe that AI can become a copywriter, content creator, uh, to replace art? And, or will this, in this case, you just be stuck in a loop when it comes to AI automation? Can you elaborate? So, so like recently, AI is being used for creativity, uh, for art. Oh. They paint right now. So do you believe that AI, aside from service automation, but in the creativity perspective, in, uh, in writing scripts for ads, do you believe that this would be the future, or will this, in this case, be stuck in a loop? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for so interesting question. Well, definitely, there is a progression in the development of artificial intelligence. So initially, we developed calculations of uh, analytical artificial intelligence. We are developing mechanical artificial intelligence. Um, the next step is to try to develop uh, any kind of feeling artificial intelligence. We exactly published uh, this year a paper in the journal Service Research focusing the attention on this. It's very, very difficult deeply related with uh, the creativity that you are highlighting. Um, definitely, if you analyze creativity, there are ways to try to synthesize, to try to structurate creativity. Um, also, it's very, very interesting because, well, uh, nobody's German here? German. All right. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. If she allows me, I will make a, a joke. <laughs> okay. Talking about this, no, because well, uh, the people from the south, including Portuguese, we are more. Uh, we are not very structured as you are. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. So we we need to develop ourselves in terms of uh, to, to do things at the end. Oh, okay, so we are very, very uh, creative in terms of that, okay? But uh, the German people, they have developed very different ways in order to improve the creativity of things. So we do not need to believe that creativity could not be structurated. There are ways to develop creativity. Okay, thank you. One more question. Only because we have <laughs> the break time. Now you want to look at both of our brains, I think, <laughs> and give us a creativity task. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, firstly, uh, thank you f for your nice words. And my question: What, what uh, was surprising in your presentation 
is that the survey data just accounted for 3.3 percent. Yep. It's uh, we are talking about the most used tool in yep. in real markets in in, in in real business. But my question is, um, uh, in the meantime, did you thought in using another uh, brain model because the uh, Brian Knudsen model is uh, 15 years old mm -hmm. or so? And uh, the method that you use, I think it is a linear re uh, regression, just o o o OLS. You never thought, or did you, in this meantime, use uh, machine learning, for example? No, or not yet? It's, it's a very good question. The reviewers of, the, of marketing science, where this is on the review, had very similar ones, so now we have have a drink later. Um, but no, I'm joking. Um, I mean, I'm not joking about this. Um, so these are exactly um, some of the feedback we received in the review process, right? So the um, we, we use the OLS because of its simplicity, because we want marketers to use this, right? So um, the review team asked us to use machine learning um, and uh, we, so we used random forest because that's given um, our exercise here where we have so many different data types coming in um, uh, you know, felt the best for us to do um, uh, because it also has the interactions between the data sources, right? So, um, but, um, so the, the results are robust that fMRI has um, an important contribution. Survey data with using the random forest comes a bit higher up. That's also something that the review team announced. It was actually the review team liked the paper, actually. It was the editor who didn't like it. Um, he said, no, no, surveys are important, right? It's obviously a, a provocative finding, right? So because we all do survey research. But again, it's, I think it's about the question that you're asking. I think there are a lot of, you know, things where surveys are beautiful but maybe less for this question that we're asking here. Um, and then, so the Knudsen model, I mean, the Knudsen model is just so validated over time, although it's old, right? So that's why I think we're very sure just of those regions, and that's why, why I liked it, so because of the theory-driven approach, because we could have, you know, mined the brain imaging data even more. I'm sure something in the visual areas could also have been relevant here, but we really wanted to say, look, we want to reduce our degrees of freedom as researchers um, using this big data and just stick to the things that we have theoretical priors on. Okay, we have uh, only 10 minutes for next session, so we are going to have a short break, and then we are going to have three sessions, uh, the next session here presential, and we have two sessions in the same time, and uh, in the afternoon we have also four sessions. In the end of the afternoon, we have a free guide tour in Santiago de Compostela, the meeting point is part of the principal de los Hotel de Reis Católicos, and you are all invited to be with us in the end of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. I have to check out the fake person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is for Carl.
tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that tomorrow. Okay, shall we continue? Okay, so let's start this ses uh, session. We will have four presentations here. The first one will be Concepcion Varela Neira. Hi. Is it right? Correct. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. And the title of and the title of presentation is Social Media Media Followers, the role of value congruence and the social media manager. The stage is yours, Concepcion. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Concepcion Varela, and I'm going to present, as uh, he said, a paper uh, done by me, Zaira Camoira Rodriguez, and Teresa Garcia Garazo. Well, uh, Hotsuite Digital says in 2021 that 58% of global population is an active user of social media. And the number of users and the time devoted to using social media is just increasing every year. This implies that companies need to integrate social media into their business strategy to keep com being competitive. However, key questions remain unanswered. Most of the studies in social media focus on how to adapt the marketing mix to this new environment. However, the role and the impact of social media managers has been neglected. This is surprising since social media man managers have role specifiers that make them important to study and also because digital marketing positions are the ones that are the most demanded in the market today and they are expected to keep being the most demanded in future years. So if they are the most demanded and they have role particular particularities that will make them a, of interest to study, why no one is studying social media managers? Why are they, why are they special? What, why do we have to study them? Why is not just another customer contact employee or a back office employee? I mean, because they do both things. They can be considered traditionally back office employees because they design, they implement the, the brand as a communication strategy in social media. They identify and deal with crisis. They um, try new tech. They um, establish the social media policy on the company regarding what social media should employees use and how. So they have back office uh, tasks, but at the same time, they are in direct contact with customers in social media. They post content, they respond to queries, they respond to comments, they have to engage audiences, they have to uh, develop relationship with relationships with these customers. So they have a larger role in the organization than the traditional back office or the traditional front office employees. So we are going to study social media managers and what is from our point of view one of the main things to study in social media managers it's authenticity because for social media content to be engaging to to engage audiences they, it has to look authentic people have to believe that they are be, that what they receive is authentic so a success metric in in social media is authenticity if the social media manager the, represents the voice in the, of the organization in social media, the perceived authenticity of the social media manager is key for the social media success. So this is the model we propose. We, propose, we are going to study the antecedents of uh, the perception of the followers, the social media followers' perception of the social media manager authenticity, and we're going to see the impact on the social media followers' behavioral intention, their willingness to pay premium price. 
Uh, what contribution does this model make? Well, first, it studies social media managers. As I said, most studies in social media analyze social media content or strategy, but do not focus on the role of the social media manager. We also study uh, perceived authenticity, and there's very little literature that studies the perceived uh, authenticity of employees. In fact, there are calls for research of purchase behavior in authenticity models in the case of frontline employees. We also study uh, the moderating role of task competence in the relationship between authenticity and willingness to pay. This is the first study that we know that studies this relationship, and we believe it's relevant because authenticity may not be as important for everyone. I mean, we don't always have to um, perceive authenticity as relevant to us. Not all of us have to perceive it the same way. So we want to see the moder moderating effects. And we're focusing on task competence because social cognition has been increasing, receiving attention as a relevant construct uh, to understand uh, consumer responses. However, from the, the competence dimension of social cognition has received very little attention in the technology-driven environment. So we want to study so, uh, competence in a technology environment such as social media. We believe that cues in the social media content give information regarding the competence of the person that is uh, posting this content. And we are also the first that we know of to study the antecedents of the perceived authenticity of, social, of the social media ma manager. Uh, we focus on value congruence because, uh, well, in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the congruence between the values of the social media follower and the values posted in the social media brand presence. Okay, we believe that, uh, well, we, we, we don't believe, it's been said that advertising is the most um, important or the most memorable aspect of an organization communication, and uh, we believe that the postings in social media give cues regarding values of the company and the brand that affect the responses of the consumer. So we're going to see how they affect. So what do we propose? We propose that perceptions of the social media manager authenticity are positively related to willingness to pay premium. Uh, well, it's a professional environment. In a professional environment, we can expect employees to be authentic because they have profit m motivations, no? So uh, if they come across to customers as, auth as authentic as being their true selves, we believe that's going to show that they are not in a selling mode. If they are not in a selling mode, they can come out as uh, honest and as willing to help and uh, uh, worried about the person, as the person more than just the dollar value that it represents, but as the person as me. I'm a person. I'm important. So that's going to uh, develop confidence in the brand, and it's going to also establish a deeper relationship with the brand. I mean, we are going to feel that they want some deeper relationship with us, and that is going to result in more willingness to pay. We also argue that value congruence is going to be related to perception of authenticity and willingness to pay. Well, value congruence is the perception that my values fit those of the organization. If my values fit those of the organization, this com the communication between me and the brand is going to be smoother. It's going to be easier, and there are going to be less uh, conflicts or interpersonal conflicts or ambiguity in the relationship. And if there's a smoother communication, that is going to mean that I'm going to understand better the company, and I'm going to uh, have a better opinion and a better attitude toward the company. And also, value congruence has been said to impact or to generate positive sentiments and liking. So if I have value congruence to what the social media manager is saying, then I'm going to have a greater liking toward the social media manager. I'm going to have a better attitude to the, towards the social media manager. So I'm going to see them as more authentic, as better, in many senses. So that's what we propose. 
And finally, we propose the moderating effect of task competence. Uh, well, we are going to use, we believe that, we are not going to use, we believe that the social media followers use cues of what it's said in social media to, to believe or to uh, obtain beliefs regarding the competence of the person that is working that social media presence. So what do we think? Um, re um, we're going to use the perception of, this, of, of the observer of the content to re regarding co uh, task competence. What does the resource vast view theory say? It says that uh, personal-based resources are things such as employee technical know-how, employee loyalty, things like that. So we think, OK, that's more or less the same as employee task competence, employee authenticity. Those are also, or can also be said, as personal-based resources. And it also says that intangible resources are things such as brand reputation, brand reputation uh, custom, customer relationships, because customer relationships are something that it's hard to reach sometimes and hard to imitate. The same happens with the perception of value congruence. If, I, if the customers perceive that they have congruence of values with me, that is something rare and difficult to uh, imitate. So we are going to say that uh, that I'm lost, sorry, that value congruence is going to be an intangible resource. So if we believe that all three of them, authenticity, task competence, and value congress are resources, what does the economic theory of um, complementarity says? say? It says that when resources are complementary, when they work together better, they, they have a greater effect together than what they would have from their, their independent use. So the return of a joint use of these resources is going to have a greater return, I mean, the return is going to be greater than the return of each individual resource summed together. Why? Well, we believe that task competence implies that the employee, the social media manager, is going to perform better. I mean, they are going to be better at the internal tasks needed for a successful social media use. They're going to have a better provision of information to the social media follower. They're going to Mm, work better when there are problems, they are going to solve better those problems. So this, imp uh, this improvement in performance, it's going to imply, it's going to color, and it's going to strengthen the relationship between the rest of resources in authenticity or willingness to pay. Well, this is our model, and what do we do? We test it with 327 uh, social media users who followed a brand in social media. We did this in Spain with an online survey, and we obtained that most of our users were Instagram users, followed by, fa by Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And most were women with an average age of 37.35 years old. They, uh, were, they were uh, following this uh, social media brand, well, this brand in social media, sorry, for almost five years, and they usually have an interaction of once per month with the brand. To measure the, the different constructs in the model, we use the scales adapted from previous investigations. So willingness to pay premium price was adapted from Gaudi et al. 2016, social media manager authenticity from you and Arnold 2019, value congress from Celsius and Geely 2010, task competence from Dimancio 2010. And we incorporated two control variables, which were age and gender of the social media follower. Well, here you can see the, the statistics, the descriptive statistics of the constructs, as well as the correlations. We can say regarding uh, reliability and validity that everything is supported. Uh, we have an average very extracted and composite reliabil reliability over the recommended thresholds. Uh, lambda parameters are significant and over 0.5. Discriminant validity is also supported because uh, confidence intervals do not include the unit value. Uh, correlations are uh, higher than the average very extracted squared. Well, all of these things that are usually used to measure uh, the, the correct, uh, the, that the measures are correct. 
Well, regarding results, we, uh, we used path analysis to test the results uh, because we wanted later to also test indirect effects, so it was the easiest way, less complicated, to, uh, to test our model. It's, it has the benefits, or some of the benefits, of SEM models or of, um, structural equation models, but it's less complicated, so we used path analysis. What do we see? We see that a manager's authenticity has a positive and significant impact on willingness to pay, and we see that a value congruence has a positive and significant effect both in authenticity and in willingness to pay. We also find that ta task competence interacts with both of them uh, in their effects. So how does that interact? How does that work? Well, we see that task competence increases or strengthens the impact of value congruence on authenticity, and it also strengthens the impact of authenticity on willingness to pay. So the greater the task competence, the greater the effect of both in their subsequent outcomes, okay? Uh, well, because we were proposing a moderated mediation model, we also tested for the significance of the indirect effects between uh, value congruence and willingness to pay through a perceived authenticity. We find that this indirect relationship is significant to, uh, at levels at moderate and high levels of task competence. When task competence is low, the indirect effect doesn't exist, but when it's moderate or high, it does. And the relationship between value, well, the indirect relationship between uh, value congruence, congruence and willingness to pay through authenticity is greater the greater the task competence. This, uh, so what are the conclusions of our study? Well, we find that uh, we need to study social media managers. Uh, they, they have shown, it, it, the, the study shows that their characteristics, their skills have a significant impact on followers' outcomes. We see that uh, they have to convey authenticity and, and competence, because that will have a positive effect on their willingness to pay of the, cost of the customers. We see that this means that uh, managers should try to hire social media managers that have a knowledge of the social media environment, that can uh, have, that have expertise, that have training, not just someone stuck there doing social media but without any knowledge because they have to um, well, uh, all, do all these analytics, monitoring and things, and all these things show better task competence, better willingness to pay. We see that it's also important to see the perception of the customer regarding this social media manager, not just the actual real competence or authenticity, but the perception of the customer. Uh, this is interesting because most studies on um, perception of competence or in or employee authenticity have not studied this in a technology environment, and we see that it's also relevant in a technology environment. We see that value congruence is very significant. We see that a, post, a content posted in social media must be must adjust to the values of the target audience. This contributes to the literature in value congruence because it hasn't been studied in a technology-driven environment, but also to the social media uh, literature because it shows that to obtain positive results in social media, you have to have content that fits the values of the, of the customers. So what should social media managers do? Before getting into any social media platform, they should know, they should study conversations of that social media platform. Study those conversations, see what values that the people in those platforms have, and after that, when they start posting content in that platform, they have to post content that sends cues, that has inherent messages that show values that adapt to those of the target market, okay? Uh, and, and well, regarding limitations, the studies 
uh, cross-sectional, so as we all know, the possibility of uh, or the causality can only be inferred and we cannot be sure about it. There's a possibility of common method bias because all the constructs are measured by social media followers. And regarding future research, uh, we're only focusing on task competence, but another relevant dimension of competence is social competence. So it would be interesting to study the impact of social media compet or social competence, sorry. We also find it interesting to compare the models between different services, different social media platforms, different uh, social media motivations. Not everyone is in social media for the same reasons. And finally, we believe that it would be interesting to study which cues give rise to these perceptions of these beliefs regarding task competence and value congruence in social media. Uh, I think I'm done it in time. If not, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Concepcion. Are there uh, questions in the room? One thing that uh, you, you were presenting, or I was thinking about uh, the role of credibility of social media because there, are, there is a buzz that everything that comes in the social media is fake or something like that, that establish it news, for example, these, uh, these are the, the right case. one. Well, this is, this is not a scientific value, but my impression is it is not like that. <laughs> but um, do, do you, what do you think about the, the, the role of credibility here in your, in your model? I think credibility is uh, fundamental, but I think authenticity has hmm? a, like a dimension, an ignorant, it has ignorantly part of credibility. I mean, if you believe that someone is authentic, you believe that it's be being true to their self. So if they are being true to their self, they have to be credible. I mean, yeah. there's a part of, there's a relationship between authenticity and credibility. In fact, in some of the models of authenticity that work it as a, a multi-dimension construct, they include credibility. The problem here is that we're only like using a, a very simplistic measure of authenticity. But it's the only one we've found regarding employees' authenticity. Most of the studies on authenticity are in brand authenticity. And we didn't want to study brand authenticity. We wanted to see how the employee is working here. So that's why we wanted to study employee authenticity and not brand authenticity. But when you, when you work the construct of authenticity, it's true that there's a, like a dimension of credibility in it. If we are authentic, we are credible. It's impossible to be authentic and not be credible. I mean, you're, you're trying, you're, you're coming out as a person that it's, it's saying what it thinks. It's being true to what it believes. So that gives you credibility. Yes, the, 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 these are the constructs that are connected. It's a nice, nice, issue, nice uh, task to, to, to study. Is Web3 more authentic than Web2? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Amalia, you, you were asking? Yes. Thank you, Concepcion, for your presentation. I see the title, Social Media Fellows, the role of value congru congruence and the social media manager. As a fellow follower in social media, I usually do not care about the social media managers. I did not quite understand the study that you did um, what is the, the link between the followers, the willing to pay, and the social m media managers? Um, no. what, what is the, the role, I mean, for, of, 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 this, of this study from the social media followers point of view? What, where we're studying is social media followers' willingness to pay the brand. It hasn't, it, like the construct itself has nothing to do with social media managers. Like we were asking if, are you willing to pay premium for this brand, okay? But we wanted to see if this behavior intention, if this uh, how we behave towards the brand has anything to do with the social media manager. Like it's, an, it's a behind job, no? We, social media, it's, it's um, worked by social media manager. So they not are- all, Not all the time. Not all the companies have social media managers. Well, they have something, someone that works the social media. So if you understand that anyone that works in social media is the social media manager, all of them have some kind of social media manager. 
Other thing is that it's an exclusive kind of social media manager, or it's also, if you're talking about hotels, maybe the receptionist who is doing reception duties, and it's also doing social media manager duties, you know? But someone is behind that social media presence and is, doing, is posting content, is responding to queries, you know, all those kind of jobs. And it's, in theory, analyzing if the social media campaigns is being successful or not. So we wanted to see if uh, how the social media person, uh, so the social media manager, uh, the characteristics of that social media man 